Hi, everyone. As Dean said, I'm Dr. John Schinner. Or, there we go. Okay, so what I need you to do here, this is um, an exercise or experiment, if you will. There's going to be two teams of three. One team is wearing white shirts, one team is wearing black shirts. I need you guys to count the number of times that the team in white shirts passes the basketball. It's about 20 seconds long, there's no sound. Just count the number of times the team in white passes the basketball, okay? Okay, now what did you come up with for an answer? Okay, now remember your answer. Now I'm going to tell you a joke. And it makes fun of my own profession, which I love. Uh, there was a psychologist, and he was seeing, doing a group therapy session with four mothers. Each mother had a small child with her. He says to the group, you're all obsessed, and it shows up in your children's names. He points to the first mother, and he says, you are obsessed, with shopping, you went so far as to name your daughter Penny. And at this point, the other mothers kind of rustled in their seats nervously. And he points to the second mother and he says, and you are obsessed with eating. It shows up in your daughter's name. You named your daughter Candy. <laughs> at which point, one of the other mothers nudged the other one and said, she's awfully skinny. Maybe she eats it in and out. Um, so, he <laughs> so he points to the third mother and he says, and you're obsessed with drinking. You named your daughter Brandy. At this point, the fourth mother grabs her son by the arm and says, come on, Dick, we're getting out of here. <laughs> now, by the way, there's nothing dirty in that joke, but thinking makes it so. Um, because I didn't, I didn't mention if that's sex, she's addicted to sex, um, if that's done within or without a marriage. So that's all in your mind. Um, so now what I need you to do is watch this again, see if you notice anything unusual. Same video. So about 80% of a crowd this large will miss the guy in the gorilla suit walking slowly through the picture because they are so intently focused on getting the answer right and on following the basketball. But this is also what emotions do to us. When you're in a negative emotional state, fear, anger, sadness, let's say, it narrows your attention to a point and you miss some things that are very obvious things that otherwise you would pick up. When you're in a positive emotional state, joy, awe, curiosity, um, hope, it broadens and builds. So it opens up your awareness. It makes you more aware of things around you. It makes you more creative. It makes you more innovative. It makes you more resilient. It gives you more hope. So that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today. A um, little bit about myself, I've got four children, uh, two boys, two girls. I've got a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 3-year-old. Um, I like to tell stories about my kids because they make me laugh. Uh, we were at church, this was a couple years ago, and both my sons are um, toeheads. They're blonde, they've got very white hair. And one in particular has a lot of white curly hair. And I went to the room to pick up my son, who I was at the time, I think, four. And I was talking with a mother in there, and I was telling her that I had, you know, four children and another son. And then uh, we're sitting by a window. So I'm with my, my youngest son, who is four, this other mother that I just met. And my oldest son comes running up to the window and goes, hey, Dad, how you doing? And he was with a friend, and she goes, oh, which, she goes, is that your son? And I said, yeah. And she said, which one's yours? Well, I said, it's a towhead the one with blonde hair, and uh, my youngest son said, better a toehead than a butthead. And I thought, <laughs> oh. 
And, you know, I don't know where he got that word, but it's just not a good first impression to leave when you're at church, you know. You... So in terms of reaching your potential, what I found, I, I grew up as a in a thinking family where academic achievement was hot, it was the highest value, the highest I could hope to achieve was to get straight A's, uh, valedictorian, go to UC Berkeley. It was all about thinking. So I went to UC Berkeley, I got a PhD in psychology, um, became a school psychologist, worked in Fremont for a while, and what I found, that the best part of my job was working with the students. However, they had very serious issues, and they would come and sort of share these issues with me. And what I found is that I would take these emotions, their emotions in, because we know that emotions are contagious to an extent, and I couldn't, I didn't have any way to get rid of them. So I was weighed down by their fear, their anger, their sadness, and eventually it led to a depression. It led to my lower back going out, it led to a, a number of problems. And I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm a psychologist, I went to Cal. If I can't deal with my emotions, who can? And so I spent the next seven to ten years researching emotion. And what are the best, the most scientifically proven methods and tools that we have to manage things like fear, anger, sadness, but not only to manage and mitigate the negative side of things, but also what about the positive side of things? How do we cultivate more positive emotions? What are the positive emotions? Why do we need them? Why do they exist in an evolutionary perspective? So what I've found over the years is that if you want to create the most powerful you you can create, if you want the most powerful mind that you can create, it's a balance between that thinking, rational side of your mind and that feeling, emotional side of your mind. And what I've found is that we're all quite good at the thinking side of things. We're excellent thinkers. We can rationalize anything. Where we have trouble is on the feeling side of things. And there's a book out by uh, Dan Pink, I think his name is, The, the New Mind. I think he was a speechwriter for Clinton. And his argument is that it's no longer going to be enough to be a smart thinker like we grew up um, knowing, that now we're going to have to develop more of the right side of the brain, the more emotional intelligence side, empathy, mindfulness, creativity, innovation. And part of his thinking is that the knowledge that's out there is so pervasive and so available that anyone can get any data they need via the Internet. It's free, it's accessible, it's easy to get. So we've got to look at other ways to separate ourselves from the pack, and in my mind, to me, what I've been working on is the resiliency, positive emotions. It's the emotional part of the package. So what is emotional resiliency? And there's been a lot of studies over the past hmm, 10 years looking at emotion. And for a long time in psychology, we didn't really look at emotion because it was too squishy, too soft, and we didn't know how to measure it. We're starting to come up with ways to measure it. Um, and what we've found specifically on emotional resiliency, resilient people are those that bounce back, bounce back quickly from tragedy, from difficulty, from hardship, from challenge. And they bounce back not only as good as they were, but better than they were. And there's actually a, a recent theory that's come out from John Hyde at University of Virginia that challenge, difficulty, trauma are all necessary for a happy, thriving, and meaningful life. So instead of post-traumatic stress disorder, it's now post-traumatic growth. So think about that as we're going through this, that maybe there's a reason that we are where we are. Maybe there's a lesson to be learned, because that's part of the positive psychology of things as well, that we need to find the positive meaning in these negative circumstances. The better we can do that, the better off we're going to be. The more positive emotion we will experience, the more innovative and creative we will be, the better we will be in interviews, and we'll all be a little bit better off. So, in the studies that have been done on resiliency, what we found is that highly resilient people consciously cultivate positive emotions through the use of humor, relaxation techniques such as mindfulness, meditation, yoga, 
and realistically optimistic thinking. But what we found, though, is positive emotions become this huge part of resiliency. And it makes sense to me. I mean, positive psychology is a relatively new branch of psychology. It studies, it's the science of happiness. It's the science of positive emotion. And what, what we've done in years past is look at, for the past 100 years, we've been operating off the old medical model of what's broken with you, we'll fix it. We'll find it, we'll fix it. It's a mechanistic model. And what we're finding is that the more that we focus on positive psychology, all this great research is coming out of it, and it's focusing on what's right with you, what's going well with you, what are your strengths, what are your passions. And then there's all this on positive emotions as well. And this research is going on around the world at some of the best universities in the country. This is old stuff you might be familiar with, just general emotional intelligence. So why should you care about emotions? Well, VPs with emotional intelligence skills outsold those without by about 300%. When you've got sports, when you've got high level of athletes like Paul, those with emotional intelligence perform better. They generally recover faster. Students perform better. They will persevere through difficulties, more likely to graduate. And then this one is pretty big to me, that the degree of your emotional intelligence actually predicts how desirable your first job is, how much you earn, and the career path or the progress of your career. And then there's some added bonuses. Um, we live longer, so real, realistically optimistic people live seven to ten years longer than pessimistic people. Uh, they've got better immune system functioning, and they're more satisfied with life. So there's something there that's very important that's going on with this positivity, negativity. Um, and we see it even in the power of thought, even in our day-to-day -day thoughts that run through our mind. And on average, we have about 50,000 thoughts running through our head. And that number can range from 10,000 to 100,000. But what we find is that the vast majority of those thoughts are negative in nature. And if you take nothing away from my talk, nothing else away from it today at all, take this away, that there are times when your thoughts and your feelings lie to you. And so the job then becomes, how do you discern which thoughts and which feelings are telling you the truth and which ones are lying to you? Because ideally, I want all of you to become expert, catastrophic thought challengers. So if we multiply this out, so we've got 50,000 thoughts per day, 80% of them are negative. So we've got about 14.6 million negative thoughts running through our, our mind each year. And the math becomes pretty big pretty fast. So if you're 40, you might have 584 million times you've told yourself that you are fat, stupid, lazy, boring, ugly, bald. Oh, sorry, nothing personal. Um, so it, it's not so much for me, do our thoughts affect us? It's at what point do they affect us? Because they do affect us. I mean, we know that they affect us. And part of it is challenging those thoughts that are not telling you the truth. The other thing that's been interesting lately is that we've found in the past few years that the brain is constantly evolving, growing, changing. We used to think it took years or months for the brain to change. Actually, 20 years ago, we thought that the brain was just done developing at the age of 21 or so. We now know that the brain continues to develop and grow and change throughout the lifespan. We also know that the brain changes in a matter of minutes, not hours. So that you will have a different brain when you leave here than you did when you came here this morning. And that to me is absolutely amazing. So don't worry about teaching an old dog new tricks. You can learn new tricks. The other thing that's interesting to me is that 1% of your body's cells are created anew each day, which means that after one month, you're about one-third renewed. After about three months, you're about 90% completely new cells, so a little over three months, you've got a completely new body in terms of at a cellular level. So it may not be th that you can't teach an old dog new tricks so much as you can't teach an old cell new tricks. It may be that there's a cellular mem memory going on and that it just takes a little over three months for those cells to replenish themselves. Just a thought. We've also found that we used to think there was one emotional reservoir in us. 
and it had both negative and positive emotions in it. And what we found in the past few years is that there's actually two reservoirs. There's one for positive and one for negative. And a lot of people say, well, duh. Um, but we didn't know this scientifically. We had no research to back this up. The thing that is interesting about this to me is that it says that just because you are not unhappy doesn't mean that you're happy. Does that make sense? So the absence of negative emotions doesn't mean that you're feeling good. So it tells me that we've got to work on both. We've got to work to mitigate or manage those negative emotions, and we've got to work to cultivate or create or nourish the positive emotions. So positive emotions, as I was mentioning earlier, they open us up. And I was thinking of you guys when I was preparing this and thinking that if I were going into a job interview, I would definitely want to be in a positive state of mind, a positive state of being, um, experiencing some of those positive emotions because I would want to be on top of my game and coming up with innovative, creative ways to answer an interviewer's questions. One of the ways you can do that is by writing down your past accomplishments throughout your life and going over it prior to the interview just to put you in a positive state of mind. There's a couple other things that I'll share with you, um, assuming we have time, uh, that are proven exercises that are simple and easy that you can do that work as effective as an antidepressant, but more quickly. All right, negative emotion, as I mentioned earlier, narrows your focus, and it helps. I mean, negative emotions are things that we need. They're necessary. They're Anger, fear, sadness, they've all got a purpose. Anger serves to remove obstacles from our way. Sadness is there to keep us close to home after we've suffered a loss. Uh, fear is there to get us to run away when we're in danger. So what do we know about these positive emotions? Why, why should you care? Which was a big question in science for quite a while, at least in psychology. So we know that positive emotions help you become your best by opening up your heart and mind to new ideas, new skill sets, new ways of being. There's, they create internal resources that you can tap later. So if your loved ones need support from you, you've got an, a bucket of positive emotions, a reservoir of positive emotions that you can tap to support your loved ones. Speaking of networking, it helps you to network better. It helps you to build longer lasting ties, better relationships. And this is, it, they allow you to produce more accurate mental maps of the world. Again, it opens you up to new information. So. You've got more information coming in, which you can judge as useful or not. When you've got new information coming in, you're going to have to revise your mental maps. And one of the things that is exciting to me is this idea that there's converging research. It's consilience is what it's called. But it's converging research that's coming out. So it's research from several different areas that shows that there's something important about this ratio of positivity to negativity. It's five to one for executive teams, management teams, if they want to function at their best. It's four to one for couples, if you want a successful marriage. And it's three to one for individuals. And the three to one ratio is this. You need three times as much positive emotion in your life as negative emotion. I don't know about you, but that's pretty hard to do. 75% of the time in positive emotion. Um, but you can increase how positively you feel, how often you feel positive, and how long you're there. And what we found is that positive emotions are fleeting and fragile, so you've got to be on the lookout for them. You can create them yourself, things like gratitude. By the way, Dean and all the volunteers, thank you very much for today. From what I understand, there was... From what I understand, there was 130 to 140 volunteers that worked to make this day happen. Um, so gratitude is one. Learning to savor the moment. Um, learning to savor what comes in through your five senses, which is part of mindfulness. Um, but there's two books out right now that I would recommend. One is Positivity by Barbara Fredrickson. One is Born to be Good by Dr. Keltner at UC Berkeley. Both have a three to one ratio in there. And I think you're gonna be hearing more of this as it comes up. But there's definitely something meaningful there. So what are the best predictors? How do you know if you're going to feel positive emotions down the road? Feeling that you can count on others. You feel like you've got some decision over how you spend your time. 
You feel like you learned something new yesterday and you did what you do best yesterday. Doing what you do best goes back to John Garamendi's comment about passion. And I think he's absolutely right. And I think that Paul and Skip both spoke to this, that if you've got something you're passionate about, it doesn't become work any longer. And it always involves doing your best because it becomes effortless. Uh, Dennis Charney did Grand Rounds at Mount Sinai in 2007. And he did a presentation on stress and resiliency. And he looked at 750 Vietnam veterans who had been held captivity, held in captivity in Vietnam for six to eight years. They were tortured, they were kept in solitary confinement. And this particular group of 750 um, soldiers came out of that experience relatively unscathed. They were healthy. They were the epitome of resilience. So his thought was, okay, What's, what are the commonalities between this, between this group of 750 people that we can pull out some meaning about resiliency? And here's what he found. They had a sense of humor. They were realistically optimistic, not foolishly optimistic. They were altruistic, so they would do things to help out other people in the camp. They had a strong moral compass, a set of unshatterable beliefs. Most, not all, had a strong faith, strong spirituality. Many of them had a role model, and even if the role model wasn't in the prison camp with them, they had a mental image of that person in their mind that they would have conversations with. They had social support, so they had family back home that they were looking forward to getting back to and seeing. They faced their fears, which I thought was really interesting and relevant to this group, because I know that we're in a situation where a lot of us are, are afraid. And even if it's not a high level or a high intensity of fear, it's a low level of anxiety. And I felt it. Um, I felt it while the lieutenant governor was speaking. Um, I feel it on the streets day to day. I feel it in the news every day. And it's one of those things that we're going to have to find a way to get past to get beyond. And the way to do it is to face one's fears. So the other two are having a purpose or meaning in life and then increasing the ratio of positive to negative emotions. Uh, so I have a sense of humor. Okay, so this is another joke for you. Uh, psychological hotline. I, I hope you don't mind if I make fun of crazy people. I am one, um, so I can do that, I think. Uh, I've dealt with anxiety and depression in my own life. Okay, so. Psycho psychological hotline, call 1-800-FRUITCAKE. Hello, thank you for calling the brand new psych line. Push one. If you're obsessive compulsive, press one repeatedly. <laughs> if you are codependent, please have someone press two for you. <laughs> if you have multiple personalities, press three, four, and five. If you're paranoid, we know who you are and what you want. Just stay on the line so we can trace the call. If you're schizophrenic, listen carefully, and a little voice will tell you which number to press. <laughs> if you're depressed, it really doesn't matter what number you push, because no one's going to answer. <laughs> okay, so facing your fears, getting back to that point. Here's one of the things that I want you to understand. Internally, the only difference between excitement I, pardon me. The only difference between anxiety and excitement is your interpretation. There's no physiological difference in the body. In both cases, your heart rate goes up, blood flows to your arms and legs, you might feel a, tight, or a tightening of the throat or chest, but you get both that in excitement and anxiety. So if you're getting anxious, just reinterpret it. I was telling myself, I was sitting down there saying, oh boy, I'm getting really excited to get up there and speak. <laughs> and this is based on the work of Fred Luskin. One of the things that I was thinking about, if I put myself in your shoes, is anger. And the anger you must feel, and I, again, I sensed it in some of the questions, the anger you must feel at the situation, at God, at your former employer. Um, because it's an unjust situation. And for some reason, we expect justice or fairness. Um, so forgiveness is a way 
the best way I know of to kick over that bucket of negative emotion and dump out that anger. It's the best way I've been taught, short of mindfulness. So here's a little bit of why you want to forgive. So people who are more forgiving, they've got fewer health problems, less stress, less risk of heart disease, less cancer, better immune system functioning, less depression and anger, and a better self-confidence. So how do you forgive? It's really easy, inexpensive. All you have to do is, before you go to bed at night, run through the list of people that have angered you in some way and say, I forgive my mother for not being there when I was 10. I forgive the company that let me go for letting me go. Um, I forgive, in my opinion, I forgive God for allowing this situation to happen. If you believe God gave you free will, then to some extent he's as culpable as the next party. So you don't have to be face to face with the offender to forgive. You do have to understand that forgiveness is a great way to get rid of your anger and that holding on to that anger only hurts you. It doesn't do anything to get back at the other party that offended you, whether that's a company or an individual or a bodiless entity. And you want to forgive daily. It's a daily practice. And what happens is you start out and you might go 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, in bed at night going, I forgive so-and-so, I forgive so-and-so. And over time, that list becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. And what they've found in studies is that you actually become more of a forgiving person. And things that used to irritate you on a daily basis don't irritate you much or as much anymore. So here's the levels of forgiveness that I've looked at. And they are, so you want to forgive other people you want to forgive yourself, which in some cases is the hardest. You want to forgive God and then allow God to forgive you and allow others to forgive you. So those are kind of the five ways I look at forgiveness when I'm doing this with a client. And then the blessings exercise. This is um, an exercise that Martin Seligman came up with and did a tremendous amount of research with. Um, Martin Seligman's the father of positive psychology. And what they did is they went through every exercise that they could find that created more positive emotion, created more life satisfaction, more well-being. And they went and vetted them scientifically. So they went to the Dalai Lama and said, what do you have? They went to Anthony Robbins and said, what do you have? and they went and found every exercise that they could, this is one of the ones that turned out to be the most powerful. It's very simple as well, inexpensive. In the beginning of the day or at the end of the day, just write down or you can think about three things that went well today and why. It's a very simple yet powerful way to shift your focus from the negative to the positive, to shift your focus from what you don't have to what you do have. And even though you may not have a job right now, you still have a lot. You still have friends, family. You've got the use of your own mind. You've got the use of your legs or arms, ability to breathe on your own. And so those are two that I would recommend you try out, the forgiveness and the blessings exercise. Because in my book, they're two of the most powerful. One deals with the negative emotions. The other one encourages more positive emotions. Thank you. you mentioned mindfulness several times this afternoon. Can you define it? And sure, mindfulness it? is um, Buddhist in origin, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a Buddhist practice. It's an exercise that you can separate from Buddhism and use, and there's 25, 30 years of research that's gone into mindfulness and showing that the daily practice of mindfulness has been amazing for uh, performance at work, performance at school, immune system functioning, um, reducing anxiety and depression and so on. Basically what it is, is sitting there or lying down and focusing on your own breath at a very basic level. Um, some of the key principles to it are 
that you are an observer of your own thoughts and feelings in your mind as you're sitting there focusing on your breath, and that you don't want to judge your thoughts and feelings as good or bad. You just sort of let them go through your mind. And the idea is that it becomes like the thoughts, because the, the thoughts that come through our head, I mean, we all have crazy thoughts. Um, that's kind of the nature of the mind, that it just exudes thought after thought after thought. And what happens is the more you do mindfulness, the more those thoughts become like bubbles rising up from the bottom of a creek bed, where if you can learn to not stay attached to the thought, the thought just kind of goes up like a bubble in the water and pops at the surface of the water. And so you're not stuck on that thought train, which is taking you to maybe some dark, dangerous places. It's John Kabat-Zinn is one of the people that's really uh, brought it around. Uh, he's at uh, Massachusetts. And it's really created a new field of medicine called integrative medicine, where they brought together medical, uh, traditional medicine and mindfulness and it's had some amazing results. And so anything that comes under integrative medicine has that traditional medicine plus that mindfulness component. Um, and it's good stuff. Easy, again, easy, simple, cheap. One more, yes. Uh, you talked about uh, emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. How would you, how do you develop that, improve that? Uh, mindfulness is a good start. Um, emotional intelligence, in my opinion, is number one, being aware of your emotions in the moment, so not after the fact. Being aware, then inserting some sort of choice or having a choice as to how you behave once the emotion strikes you. So for instance, anger. We have a real hard time with anger in the sense that we confuse the emotion anger with the action that we take because we're angry, when in fact there's a, a gap between the feeling of anger and when you react to it, of, there's a gap of 0.33 seconds. And so you've actually got about a third of a second to interrupt that anger cycle if you're very mindful, aware, um, if you get that tuned into your body, if you become that practiced. So you can sense the physiological symptoms in your body of anger. So in this case, blood rushing to your hands, for instance, to prepare you to strike someone and your feet. Um, so you'll get those physiological symptoms. You go, okay, I'm getting angry. And then you've got a split second to insert a thought, remove yourself from the situation, count backwards from five, things like that will actually help you to interrupt that anger cycle. Um, so part of it is being aware of the emotions. I mean, what I've found, and the reason I wrote the book is that my belief is that we don't have a whole lot of language to speak about. Um, emotions with. We're very uh, poor in terms of our emotional vocabulary. We can't even, many people I encountered have a hard time labeling basic, basic emotions. Uh, to give you an example, um, people with eating disorders generally tend to get a ball or a pit in their stomach, and that's the only bodily sensation that they have, and it's really um, usually some sort of mixture of fear, anger, and sadness that they have a hard time disentangling to even know what to do with. And so in my book, I talk about you know, the physiological symptoms related to each emotion so you can better identify them in the moment. And then what do you do so that you have a choice as to how you behave after you identify the emotion? Does that answer your question? Um, one more, <laughs> got one more. Or, yeah, yes, last question. Absolutely. Thank you, looks good on you too. Um, yeah, humor is, uh, amusement is one of the ten positive emotions that we've identified in uh, positive psychology and, and science. And, you know, one of the things that I like about it is that it opens up crowds to new information. Usually I'm presenting new information. I mean, I do presentations at continuation high schools where, you know, there's kids that are drug dealers, they've got ankle monitors on, uh, kids that have attacked police officers. These are some angry people. Um, and so usually when I go in, actually every time when I go in, I start off with humor in an attempt to get them to open up. Not open up to speak about themselves, but to open up to be receptive to the information that I have for them. Um, and it's very successful. I'm doing an ongoing seminar once a month at a continuation high school near here, 
And the kids look forward to me coming back. And I'm just talking about emotions. And that really um, surprised me. I thought they would be very resistant to it. And some are. Um, but 80, 90% of them are very open and enjoy it largely because I think of the use of humor. All right. Thank you very much. See you at